Hey y'all, welcome to Shades of Brown, the podcast that discusses the ever-evolving and sometimes contradicting thoughts of a Black millennial. I'm your host, Allie V, and thank you so much for being here for this episode of Shades of Brown. It's Women's Heritage Month, and this week I want to talk about Black women and the state of our mental health. Quick disclaimer, I am not a mental health professional, so what I share here is based on my lived experiences, my observations, and my research. Let's unpack it. Over the last couple of years, I think I began publicly sharing about my own mental health journey. I don't know, maybe sometime in 2019 or so. I don't know. I don't remember. But one thing that gives me so much joy is when people message me, inbox me, text me, call me and say, hey, you have any recommendations for a therapist or where I should search for one? Or, hey, I started therapy. Thank you for encouraging me. Or, yeah, I've been in therapy for the past couple of months because you have shared your story. Those kinds of messages, they overwhelm me in the best way. Like it gives me so much joy that people are choosing to do the healing work or choosing to at least go get language for their experiences, you know, in order to better themselves. Like that for me is such a gift. And I appreciate those kinds of messages. One thing I've recently noticed, though, is people who have started therapy, maybe because they've heard me or because, you know, they have caught on to the importance of it. One thing I've noticed is that a lot of people have tried it out and didn't like it. And they have, you know, tried to find someone else and they have gotten tired of the process. And it's draining and overwhelming to look for the the right therapist. And though I have shared some tips, I believe in season one, I shared about, you know, how you find the therapist. I think it was an episode titled Jesus in Therapy. I think there was a part one and part two. And one of those I share about, you know, how you go about finding a therapist. But I want to revisit that because I don't know that I have been as thorough in explaining the process of starting your therapy journey versus, you know, the benefits of therapy. Finding the right therapist is like dating. You've got to date around. They may be an amazing therapist, but that doesn't mean they're amazing for you and for your needs. There needs to be a a certain level of compatibility between you as a client and, and the therapist. So I would encourage you to treat it like that. As you are searching for a therapist, you know, as you're using psychology today with their therapy finder tool, as you're refining that search and looking for people within your network and looking for, you know, people who specialize in and what you need, treat it like you're going on a meet and greet versus, you know, your first session. What I've done when I've, you know, tried to look for a new therapist, maybe when I moved to a different state. I I try to get a consultation with them first because what happens is you'll go, you know, you'll get all excited or whatever, or or now that you've been encouraged and influenced to find a therapist, you get excited about the journey. You're like, I'm going to do this. And you go in there and you tell your entire origin story, right? You've shared all your stuff. And then you realize I want to continue this. I've got to do this exact same thing with a new therapist. Who wants to do that? Who wants to sit there and tell their entire story? You've got to get some background and some context to your therapist in order for them to best assess, you know, your needs. Right. So no one wants to keep doing that. So it's a couple of things we can do to prevent that kind of thing happening. One is getting a consultation instead of, you know, having that first appointment be a full appointment. Ask them if they will give a free consultation where you can talk to them and they can talk to you. You can express what your needs are, what you're looking for. So this will require you to know what you're looking for. It will require you to know at least a little bit about what you're needing, right? Maybe you're saying, I don't know. I just, I'm always sad. I don't know why. So I don't know what that is, but help me with that, right? Or, and you're looking to overcome that. Or maybe you have issues. What my point is there is there needs to be at least some small level of detail you can provide to the therapist, right? So they can help you. You can explain a little bit about what's going on. I'm not saying you should know exactly what's happening with you, but at least in enough detail so that the therapist can say whether or not they provide or they, you know, that they provide service in that specialty. 
So yeah, have a consultation with them. Ask them, you know, questions like, do they have a therapist? Ask them questions like, you know, how long have they been practicing? And are they licensed in your area? If you are seeking assistance that you don't have insurance or, you know, you just, you just want to pay out of pocket, that will, you know, broaden your search. But that doesn't mean now that you can pay out of pocket and just go to anybody, that doesn't mean that they can practice in, in your area, even if the sessions are virtual. So ask some questions about that. Where do you practice and how long and what are your specialties? Maybe you're looking for, for something very specific, such as OCD, and you need help in that specific areas in regards to overcoming compulsions and overcoming your obsessions. Or maybe you don't know and you're just like, you know, I want to start anywhere, but they can help you to, to figure out if they're the best fit. And that would prevent you from sharing all this personal detail because vulnerability takes a ton of courage, right? And we don't want to do that with just anybody, even though these are, you know, professionals who have committed to, you know, be people of integrity. They can't, you know, share your information. It's still private, but still, we don't want to go down that route if it's unnecessary. So I encourage you to get consultations instead of having a first full session. That may help you a lot. Also, If you ever find yourself needing to change therapists, ask them to provide you their notes, their assessment, everything like that. Or they can provide it directly to your new therapist so that the new therapist at least has some context from another professional so that you're not starting from ground zero. I had a therapist who offered to do that for me and I really appreciated it. I don't remember following up with her about that request, but I appreciated that she offered it because I was like, oh, great, because we were getting such traction and having to start over was very discouraging. It's extremely discouraging. So I wanted to just revisit that really, really quickly and express to you that, hey, like if it didn't work for you at first, you know, therapy isn't for everybody. But if you're still considering it and you're still thinking this could be beneficial, if you found the right person, look again, try again. Just, you know, be a little bit more intentional in your approach so that you can avoid certain pitfalls. And I bring this up, y'all. I bring this up because one, you know, life just be life in. But two, I've personally been seeing an increase in the number of black women dying by suicide. And it is beyond disheartening. Anyone who passes because of suicide it is just so heartbreaking. I think there's something specific happening with black women. It's strange. It's strange times. You know, it's hard times. It's overwhelming times. And I just wanted to check in and like have the conversation to make us a bit more aware of, of what's happening, whether with us or with our community. In the last two months, there have been two different black beauty queens who have plunged to their death from buildings. I believe one was in New York and one was in Miami. And it's bananas, y'all. It's bananas. Like I I said, my condolences to those families. One was confirmed suicide. Her mom, the lady's mom, I forget her name, Zoe something. Her mom issued a statement pretty much confirming that it was suicide. The other, they determined it was a tragic accident and they determined that no foul play was involved. I don't want to call it a suicide because they didn't. But what we do know is that the cops were responding to a possible suicide attempt, which tells me that whoever called either saw someone in danger or she, the person who died, called the cops, you know, because she knew what was about to happen. Regardless of what happened, The police were responding to a possible suicide attempt. And the young lady, she was in a coma for a couple of weeks before she ultimately passed. And the family has decided to use the words tragic accident, saying that if she had a choice, she would still be here. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that if she accidentally fell off the building. I don't know. All I know is this. She's not here. She fell off a building. All signs point to suicide. I acknowledge that the details of both of these stories are extremely sketchy, right? Like they're close in time. They're similar in nature. They're just incredibly odd. And it's possibly some conspiracy there. You know, I don't put anything past people, especially when it comes to black folks, especially when it comes to black, you know, black women. And, you know, in their industry, in the beauty industry, like I I don't put anything past anybody. Right. And I immediately began to notice all the conspiracies that were, you know, circulating the Internet when both of these things happened. Like something ain't right, something ain't right. This is off. I don't know. They wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that. 
And while, again, I do acknowledge that this nation has done so much harm to us that it is very normal and plausible for us to be skeptics, I do get why we are skeptical. I think that we have to be very careful in that skepticism surrounding this particularly because it can perpetuate a narrative that we're trying to eliminate. And that narrative is the strong black woman narrative. We've been conditioned. We as black women have been conditioned to keep up appearance and to remain proud and to maintain our poker face, right? Like we're seen as black women are strong. Black women have high tolerance for pain. Black women can handle it. Black women are unbothered. These things perpetuate strong black woman syndrome. It perpetuates the idea that we don't need help. That our struggles are to be dismissed because we can handle it. We got it. Oh, she all right. That's not too much for her. But truth is, black women are suffering in silence. Even those who are surrounded by a loving community or even those who seemingly have the perfect life, such as these beauty queens. Even after one of their moms confirmed it was suicide, there was still talk about it being foul play. Because there's this idea that a strong black woman could never... She would never take her life. Nothing would ever be so bad that she would choose to end her life. But the truth is, she did. That's the truth. The truth is, she was smiling and happy and making folks laugh and bringing joy to people's lives and posting on Instagram as if everything was fine. And she was suffering. That is the truth. This idea that certain tragedies are beyond us. Nah, like we are human. Period. And and for us in specific, and, and for us particularly, I don't know that it's just depression. I believe it's high functioning depression that a lot of us have experienced, are experiencing. And it's why it's so tricky to name, why it's so tricky to label. High functioning depression is sneaky and subtle. It's dangerous. And a part of the reason why, you know, we shy away from the label of it, of course, you know, religion is part of it, oppression is another part of it. But we've been conditioned to believe that it's normal to continually suffer, that it's normal to be in perpetual despair. And that is not normal. It's not normal, not on a spiritual level, not on a relational level, not on a chemical or neurological level. That's not normal. I was reading some psychology articles to better understand um, and ascertain what exactly the differences are between, you know, just regular depression or having a depressed moment versus high functioning depression. In one of the articles I read on psychology today, it said this. It's crucial that everyone understands the difference between a person simply exhibiting depressive symptoms and any one of the several diagnosable conditions. Depressive symptoms or sadness are usually triggered by a particular event. For example, if one experiences the death of a beloved parent, it is within the realm of normal behavior to cry, have an inability to concentrate, and to experience a lack of or excessive appetite. However, these symptoms are episodic and are tied specifically to that incident. Further, experiencing sadness about the loss of a parent won't necessarily prevent you from being able to care for yourself. Depression sets in when the symptoms start to generalize to most other normal life activities for an extended period of time. This is an important difference for loved ones to note, as picking up on this sign can mean the difference between life and death with some sufferers. And that quote was not from Psychology Today, it was from another Black Women article. The Psychology Today article I was reading said this, psychologically speaking, people with high functioning depression are able to use the skill of compartmentalization where you suppress your own personal feelings for the moment and instead attend to the needs or expectations of the present. You metaphorically put anger or sadness or fear into a box in your emotion closet and stick it up on a shelf until it's the right time to deal with it. It's an important skill and one that many people know how to use well and effectively. When the time is right, when you're in a safe space to pull that pain out, you can cry or get angry or whatever you need to feel. And we do this because a lot of times we don't have time to deal with emotions. We don't have time. We're dealing with this. We're tending to 
our personal lives, we're tending to our career, we're tending to our ambitions, to school, to families, children, spouses, church ministry assignments, purpose, whatever it is, sometimes you literally do not have time to emote. You don't have time to to, to process, to sit, to pause. That's just the truth, you know? But what happens is we continually suppress and we continually show up and just normalize the idea that life just sucks, but we're going to keep showing up. We're going to keep laughing. We're going to keep doing all these things when we really need help. We really need some sort of treatment. We really need, you know, um, therapy, whatever it is. We need something to help us get beyond the bases that we've been in. And it's not like, like, you know, when it comes to high functioning depression amongst black women. It's not like this is something that we've made happen or that we have allowed. You know, this could be medical. It could be genetic. There are so many factors that play into why we get into these spaces in the first place. But this is why it's important to seek help so that we can have language for our experiences and so that we can, you know, determine our best path forward. And, you know, like we're always talking about, you know, check on your strong friends, you know, check on your funny friends, check on your, you know, on the ones who are typically the caregivers, the ones who are typically, you know, there for everyone else. And that's amazing. We, and we should. We have to I think what I'm going to say. This is something that we don't talk about as much. The truth is when you are in such a low place, in such a dark space, especially when it's for an extended period of time and you don't have an explanation for it. Because see, if a family member passes. That's explainable. Right. So your dark time, your dark space, that grieving period is expected of you to be down and out. So your community may be more understanding and may be more willing to step in and, and help and they because they understand that you're you're in a low place. They're not expecting you to show up. They're not expecting you to, to be the funny one all the time anymore, right? But when you don't have an explanation for your low place and when it has lasted for so long, the truth is you may never be truly honest to your community about what's going on. Even when they do reach out, even when you do get the check-ins, right? Whether you are the strong friend or the one checking in, like your strong friend may never be 100% honest with you about how bad it is. I think if you have one of those friends who you have, you know, determined, okay, they're, they're the strong one in our, in our group. If they ever open up to you that it's been really low for them, I think it may be a good practice to assume that it's 10 times worse than what they're saying. One thing that strong friends do, they don't want to be the Debbie Downer. They don't want to be the negative Nancy. They don't want to bring people down with them. Because again, they're the ones that are typically helping. And even though, even though they can know 100% that you are for them, you don't mind getting in the gutter with them. You don't mind sitting with them in their pain. The majority of the time, they're not going to be 100% honest. And I can't even blame them for it, right? Because the truth is, we say we're there for people. We say, you know, like through thick and thin, no matter what, no matter when, no matter where. If we are honest, like, let's just keep it a book. If we're honest, none of us want to be around someone who is constantly down and out. We just got to be 100 about it. Like, let's just be honest. We don't want to be around somebody who is all, it's, just, it's always something. They're always sad. It's always just, woe is me. No one wants to be around that person. So when you are in a state like that, you want to make sure that you don't bring that energy to your tribe. And sometimes that means people will sugarcoat how things really are. And I say that to say, if you are checking in on your strong friends, right? And they say, oh, I'm good. Let's be more specific. Let's be more intentional about how we're interacting with people. Because sometimes what saves people is just the right conversation at the right time. Even if it's not specifically about their issues, it could just be like, man, I heard from them today. They were thinking of, of me. I feel seen. I feel cared for. All right. I can live to see another day. So one, I encourage us to be more frequent in our checkups, in our check-ins with our tribe. And if that means you having to literally put in your calendar, you know, something that repeats every week or every month or every other day, however often you check in with folks, if it means putting it on your calendar so you can always remember, do that. If you're telling yourself, you know what, I'm going to be checking in every week from now on, put it on your calendar so you don't miss it. And not to make it task oriented, but to make it into your rhythm and routine so that, you know, you get a pattern flowing. Because those who struggle, especially black women who struggle with high functioning depression, you're not going to know. You're not going to know. The lady in New York, her mom didn't even know. 
And her mom knew she was suffering from depression. And her mom didn't even know how close to the edge she was, right? So for those of us who are the community, when these tragic things happen, a lot of times it's like, dang, I wish I would have known and I wish I could have done more. Well, that's limited. All we can do is show up, be present, right? Be available. And we can do that by being intentional. So check in regularly. Ask direct questions, you know, instead of something like, you know, hey, thinking about you, hope you're doing well. How about, hey, thinking about you, how are you doing this week? How are things really going? Where are you mentally right now? Where is your state of mind? Where are you emotionally? You good? Get in their business. And of course, I'm talking about, you know, people who are your true friends, who are family, right? Like get in their business because this stuff is literally life and death. I'll be a hundred. I cannot tell you how many times someone has checked in on me. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. You know, I'm making it. Meanwhile, I'll be a hundred with you. I have had those kinds of moments where someone has checked in on me, you know, and I'll say a general, you know, I'm making it. Things could be better, but you know, I'm getting through it. Meanwhile, everything is crumbling. And I was probably crying while texting that message, right? Like things were so much worse than I lit on. We do this for so many reasons, not because we don't want people to know. There are so many reasons. So just get in folks' business. Another thing you can do is say, hey, you know, I know you're the strong one. You never ask for help, but is there anything I can do for you this week? Is there anything I can do to lighten your load? I would love to help. They may say no, but you know, you can ask that every now and then or saying, hey, how can I pray for you this week? Versus a general, hey, I'm praying for you, friend. No, tell me, how can I pray for you? And what areas can I cover in prayer for you this week? Be specific, be intentional. Because again, the the strong friend may not be 100% honest, but they will greatly appreciate you checking in. They will feel seen, they will feel heard, they will feel cared for, even if they don't open up right away. So let's check in with our people. And also let's know some of the signs. Awareness is key. And awareness can sometimes mean the difference, again, between life and death. Here are some signs of general depression. It can include significant appetite changes, sleep pattern changes, perpetual fatigue. Their countenance has suddenly shifted. They, you know, casually mention that they've been skipping, you know, hygiene routines. They're much more disorganized than they usually are. If these things are happening, you know, it may be that person is in a state of depression. It could be something like, you know, talking to a friend. They were like, oh, my goodness, I haven't even had time to brush my teeth today. And it's like you just know that's just not like that person. Right. Or, you know, maybe you visit and their room is just so messy, but you know that they are one of the neatest persons, you know. They're just talking different. They're talking weird. I had a friend. She's one of my most chipper friends, like always just so, so happy and excited and joyous. There was a period of time where like literally her tone was different. When we talk on the phone, her tone was so different. The conversations were similar, but the tone was significantly different. And I'm just like, why does she sound like this? And I just began to pay attention more closely. And over the months, I would hear her say different things. I'm like, something's not adding up here. What's what's really going on? And I finally said to ask her, hey, are you good? Like, hey, are you good? What needs to happen to make sure you are still here tomorrow? Like, we got to be straight up. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what needs to happen to make sure you're still here a week from now? At least, you know, that's within your control. Let's be aware of, of those subtle changes. Because again, the strong friend is not going to be like, hey, I'm depressed. I need help. Tell me what to do. This that, That's just not how this works. Ideally, that would be wonderful if, you know, people just told us exactly what they needed. In these kinds of situations, it's probably not going to happen like that. And I am not, let me be clear, I am not by any means trying to imply that it is the tribes or the friends or the community's responsibility to make sure people who are suffering from depression remain alive. I am not saying that. What I am saying is that I believe with awareness, with open communication, with being available and being present And being a solid, good friend who is there, I think it could help people from getting so close to the edge. That is what I'm saying. I do believe that. I believe there is power in community. I believe that. And I believe community saves lives. I do believe that. I believe isolation is dangerous. I do believe that. So, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I'm not saying that it's, you know, somehow 
on us to keep our depressed people alive. That's not what I'm saying. So let me be clear in that. I don't want to make people feel that there, you know, that there is some extra pressure we have. No, I'm sick of seeing the headlines, really. You know, I'm, I'm sick of seeing us die unnecessarily. I'm sick of seeing us suffer silently. I'm sick of seeing our pain being dismissed. I'm sick of seeing us, you know, not heard. No one listens to us when we when we tell, when we do tell our stories, right? When someone commits suicide and it is confirmed suicide and we still are like, nah, that ain't happen. That's how our stories go unheard, right? Because we are like, nah, that, that gotta be something else. Nah, it was depression. It was something happening neurologically or chemically, like, or within us, like, yo, this stuff is real. This stuff is real. If you are the strong friend, I would encourage you to tap into the strength that is vulnerability and tell your people like you're not good. You know, maybe that looks like creating some sort of safe word or or some sort of like 911 call to your friends that they know, OK, we need to go into action, whether that's the girls night, whether that's, a, you know, let's go hang out. I do encourage you to. um to be more vulnerable. You are not a burden. It's very normal to need help. <laughs> it's very normal to ask friends for help. That's what friends are for, to be there. Good times, bad times. <laughs> I'll be on your side forevermore. <laughs> that was very, like, that was a really great timing. Um, I even have an example of that. If you've listened to the first couple episodes of this season, you are very aware of, you know, all the transitions that have happened in my life recently. And I've spoken a bit about how they have affected my mental health. It's an ongoing thing where I have to be very intentional about caring for myself mentally because it's very easy for me to get into a space where I'm just like, ugh, life sucks. One of those preventative measures I put into place when I first moved back home was to get away as, as often as possible, to leave this city as often as possible, just to clear my to clear my mind. And to do that in a cost-effective way, I was like, you know what? Let me just go to Atlanta once a month. I love Atlanta. It's my favorite city. My best friend lives there. I ain't got to do much. It's just a tank of gas away. I'll do that, you know, just to clear my mind. And I've done that for the past about a year, you know, pretty much for the most part, I've gone to Atlanta at least once a month. And um, with me and my best friend just chill, hang out, watch movies, binge watch something on Netflix or Stars or HBO, or whether we like have an event to go to or some concert, whatever it is, you know, it's just a time for me to clear my head, get away from people and have fun. In December, we brought the new year in together and I told her, I just wanted, I just wanted to thank her for allowing me to come, you know, every month just to get a weekend away. And I was expressing to her how grateful I was for her providing a space for me to just relax and to just be and to breathe and to whatever. Because all this whole time I've been thinking I've just been such a heavy burden. I know my countenance is not exactly the same as it was, say, in 2019, right? Or 2020. In my mind, I'm just this huge burden, you know, to my friends. And when I expressed it to her, she was like, she's like, I'm just excited that you're here every month. Like, I can see my friend. And I'm like, really? Like, here I am thinking, you know, it's just like... Oh, here we go again, you know, but it's not like that when when it's a real friend, they enjoy your presence, period. And they don't mind being there for you. So you're not a burden. You're not a burden. OK, that's a lie. It's a temptation to keep you isolated. And that is what the old folks call a trick of the enemy. <laughs> so, yeah, this is heavy, but it's a necessary conversation because we all we got. So. Check on your people. I do want to give you the suicide prevention hotline number. That number is 1-800-273-8255. You can call 24 hours a day and they um, accommodate English and Spanish languages. And that is U.S. specific, but they do have hotlines like these in most countries. So if you're listening and you're um, not in America and you're, you know, needing help, please Check out that hotline for you. There is community for you. There is medical help for you. There are resources available to help you. If you're struggling, please know that things do get better. You were created by a loving God who wants to heal you and who wants to prosper you. So I encourage you to hang in there. All right, this was heavy. So let's get into brownie points. Brownie Points is a segment where we take a moment to celebrate ourselves. We celebrate small wins, 
big wins, whatever victory you've had recently, this is a moment that we celebrate ourselves. So what are you giving yourself brownie points for this week? I'm giving myself brownie points for asking for help. I struggle like many of us asking for help and receiving help. Man, I don't know what clicked, but child. In the last week, I have asked for so much help and I am so much better for it. Like <laughs> I've gotten so much more accomplished and I feel just so much better because I don't have to worry about this and that. Um, I wanted to create this like really nice graphic to share all the highlights of Shades of Brown for the Shades of Brown birthday, which was um, March 3rd. And instead of me like trying to, you know, be in Canva all night long, trying to figure out how to do this carousel and what to say, how to make it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to outsource. And I did. And she did incredible. The graphic designer, Mary Smith, my friend, she killed it. Right. Editing. I've asked someone to help me edit. Like, I'm just like, I can't be dealing with all this crap. Like, <laughs> I need help. Even freaking laundry, bro. I'm like, yo, I need to outsource all the things. Because, yeah, it's okay. Like, it's okay to not do all the things. It really is. And I'm so proud of myself. Like, oh, this is wonderful. Like, even with, you know, creating content, I get it done in a fraction of the time when I have help. I'm like, yo, life is so much better with two people. Don't the Bible say that? It's, but two is better than one, something like that. And that's in everything. That's not just in marriage and romantic stuff. That's in everything, fam. Two is better than one. Two minds is better than one. Two sets of hands is better than one. Child, two phones is better than one. I can like read my script off of one and record with the other. <laughs> like, I just am thankful for help. Praise the Lord. And I'm proud that I was vulnerable enough to ask for it. So that's what I'm giving myself running points for today. All right, y'all. Hang in there. Life be life in, but. You still the bomb.com. Know that. You still fire. You still dope. You still a queen, a beautiful one at that. All right. So I'll leave you with this. I hope that you be well, that you love well, and that you be loved well. You deserve that. Until next week. Bye.